So let me move my computer a little bit so I can see my screens here. First, we're going to start just by going over some of the research and what it tells us about cognitive fitness. And then we're actually going to do some of the cognitive fitness exercises. So we do know from all of the research that has taken place is that the more you stimulate and challenge your brain, you offset the effects of aging and reducing your risk for dementia. So we know that dementia is not a normal part of aging. We talk about that an awful lot because used to people would say things when somebody was starting to have some type of memory loss. Well, they're just getting old. Well, now we know memory loss shouldn't happen just because you're getting older. You should slow down, but you should not have any memory loss. And slowing down and memory loss is two very different things. So there are studies that show that you could give a group, they did this, they took a group of college students in their 20s and a group of people in their 80s and gave them the same cognitive assessments. The people in the 80s scored the exact same as the people in college, but it took them longer to take the test. But the scores were the same. So it's just, you slow down a little bit. You can't multitask like you used to be able to. Uh, right now, we've all got to the point that we can be on a call like this and checking our email and my phone's going off and I might do that and we can keep up with that. And as we age, we get to where we can't multitask as well. And that's okay. We just slow down. We get to where we need to concentrate on one thing. That's not dementia. Um, dementia is when, and we all know this, it is when they actually are, those brain cells are dying. Their memories are going away. So that's not a normal part of aging. But there's some things that we can do um, with cognitive fitness. And part of it is challenging our brain so that we have more brain plasticity. Um, that way we have more cognitive reserve. <clears throat> Excuse me. So here's some interesting research. And I have people bring this up to me all the time. Uh, and uh, we've got on here some quotes from different places. Let's look at this first one. It says lower education levels are associated with a greater risk for dementia in many, but not all studies. Suggesting that the effect of education on risk for dementia may be best evaluated within the context of a lifespan development model. So to kind of follow that up though, because I don't want you hearing, oh, well, I've got a PhD, I'm good. That's not the case. So let's look at it as they kind of went a little deeper into it. So this is interesting. Does more education lower our risk or does more education makes people better able to cope with the changes associated with dementia? You can compensate longer. You may have the skills or ability to hide it better. Um, so high education plus challenging occupation and a high social demand mental stimulation and decreases the risk for Alzheimer's disease. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, I've shared this story several times. I had a gentleman who was uh, in insurance for many, many years and uh, his wife said, nobody believes me that he has anything uh, going on because he's still so social because he'd always been social. But I would be at their house and every single time he'd walk through the room, he'd come up and say, hello, my name is, and put that hand out to shake my hand. And he could sit there and banter and chit chat with me, but we had the same conversation six or seven times in an hour. But if somebody just saw him one time, they would say to him, well, there's nothing wrong with it. We just chatted. He's good. He had a social job. So he had done that for 40 years. He still knew how to do it. So that's one of the things this is talking about. So brain stimulation, a lifelong learning, that's what's important. Here's another one. We get lots of questions about crossword puzzles and about word searches and that type of thing. In um, the Journal of International Neuropsychological Society, reported that regularly working crossword puzzles slowed the onset of memory decline by as much as two and a half years. So let me also add to that. It is challenging crossword puzzles. So you start with the easy ones, but if you think about your brain fitness, just like your body fitness, 
if we go to the gym and all we do is work out my right arm, then I'm gonna have a great looking right arm. But the rest of me might not look so great. If all we're doing is those easy crosswords and we're only stimulating that one pathway into our brain, we're not working out the rest of the brain. So when the easy crosswords get to where you can do them without even hardly paying attention, or you can work them while you're watching TV, um, they're too easy. Even though that feels really good to be able to go, oh, I finished that crossword in 10 minutes, it's time to go to the medium, is what that's telling you. <laughs> so then you bump yourself up a level. If it's challenging you, that's when you're getting the most out of it. If it's something that you're actually having to think about it, then you're challenging your brain. And if you were in a scan, you would be lighting up. Your brain would be lighting up because you're having to really think about it. That next one uh, report that taxi drivers have greater gray matter volume in the hippocampus because of spatial navigation. This study suggests that in adulthood, the brain can rewire itself to new challenges. So as we take on new challenges, that's why as you do research about uh, the brain, it says two of the best things that you can do is to try to learn a new language or to play an instrument that you've never played before because it's brand new learning. You're gonna use parts of your brain that you may have never used before and it's gonna challenge you and it may frustrate you and that's okay. It's lighting up your brain, you're learning. Most of us, I think, can say, if we can think back to those classes like algebra or calculus or chemistry, where it challenged us, we had to really stop and think. We were learning, though. And again, if we'd have been under some kind of a scan, our brains would have really been lighting up. Uh, when I was at seminary and took a lot of the theology courses, there were times I was wondering if it was even written in English. I mean, it was on such a high level, I could not understand it. And I had to really concentrate and study. I had to have complete silence. I was learning. I bet my brain looked like it was on fire at that time. And that's the things we want to do. We want to challenge our brain. So what about computer games? We get asked this a lot, computer games or games on our phone. Some studies showed a decreased risk correlation in adults who do computer-based training, and some studies showed that it had no benefit. So you can kind of find either way. Computer games seem to offer a short-term boost in working memory. They mainly improve ability to perform a task in the game, not broader ability to learn and solve problems. That being said though, if you are doing games that progressively get harder, that's the ones that you want to try to be doing. So if they track you and um, as you get better at it, they make the game harder, that's the kind of game, games you want to be doing. So here's the type of things you want to do with brain fitness is you want it to be something new. New skills equal new and stronger neurons and it takes you out of your comfort zone. So instead of going, oh, I always do word searches. I just want to do word searches. No, I'm going to go ahead and try the crosswords. I'll start with the easy ones. Uh, so we want it to be new. We want to have variety instead of picking up the same thing every day. Maybe do, I'm gonna do word searches on Monday. I'm gonna do crosswords. Then I'm gonna do a computer game. Then I'm gonna do, and we'll have a different one every day also. It's like cross training your body and then challenging yourself, making sure it gets harder and harder. This is one of my very favorite we sure don't want to get caught like these poor guys did going, oh crap, was that today? And away sails the ark and there sits the dinosaurs going, uh-oh, we got left out. So here's one of the things that we can do. And whenever we're doing this in person, I have everybody do this at the same time. So if you would um, like to do this, if you pinch your nose with your right hand and touch your right ear with your left hand, and then you switch and you switch, and you switch, and you switch, and you switch. That will wake up both sides of your brain. So that is real fun to do whenever you have a whole group of people doing it. It's pretty fun to do watching y'all do it on here though. Um, but that is something also if you're sitting at your desk and you catch yourself starting at three o'clock, rather than going and getting a hit of caffeine, 
It's back and forth, back and forth, and it gets both sides of the brain working. Here's another thing that you can do. And I have had people come back and tell me all kinds of fun things about doing stuff with their non-dominant hand. So think about that. When I first started doing this, I decided I was going to text with my left hand. I now keep my phone on my left side because I can text as good with my left as I can with my right. Ooh. That used a whole different pathway in my brain when I started doing that. Next time you comb your hair or brush your hair, use your non-dominant hand. Brush your teeth with your non-dominant hand because you'll have to think. Because you can stand there right now and brush your teeth and comb your hair and be thinking about a bunch of other stuff. But if you're doing it with your non-dominant hand, it makes you think. So I had someone tell me after doing one of these, Holly, do you know how much longer it took me to sweep my floor? Because they switched it the other way and they were sweeping the non-dominant way. He said, it took me forever, but I am determined that I'm going to be able to sweep my floor left-handed. Those type things are little things we can do all throughout the day, and you're challenging your brain. And then you'll really feel a sense of accomplishment when you go, oh, I, I can text just as fast with my left as I can with my right. That's a, that's a pretty easy one to start trying to do. But you'll be surprised at how much you really have to think. Another thing is reminiscing, going back and tapping into and touching into your memories. Everybody right now, think of your childhood address. What's the address you lived as long? Mine was 201 South Ash, Eureka, Oklahoma. I can't remember the zip code though. Or do you remember the phone number you had when you were a child? 405-526-3302, that was mine. I remember the fire department and the ambulance there because that was before 911. <laughs> so going back and thinking of those type things, going back and thinking, I'm gonna list all of my teachers. Who was your kindergarten teacher? Who was your first grade teacher? Who was your second grade teacher? These are also great things to do at night if you can't fall asleep, because then you'll sit there and you will take your mind off of all this other stuff and hopefully you'll fall asleep. But you're tapping into parts of your brain you probably hadn't thought about in a while. You can also get into your memory maps where you walk through that elementary school. Walking into each of the classrooms, what did they look like? Walk through the house where you grew up. How did the doors open? What, did the, what were the colors? What did it smell like? This is all cognitive fitness, doing those things. What all jobs have you had in your life? Go back through every job you've had and try to name as many people as you worked with at each of those jobs. What did your office look like? What did your classroom look like? All of that is cognitive fitness and it's just sitting and thinking. These are also great things you can do with somebody that has dementia if you wanna do it together uh, because many times they can go back and tap into these type things. Reading out loud, reading upside down, or reading from top to bottom. That's something interesting to try to do. Um, reading out loud, so you're also you're hearing yourself, but especially if it is something like a menu, trying to turn it upside down, see if you can read it upside down. Um, mess up your mouse. So again, if you put your mouse over on the other side, if you try to use your mouse on your left side if you're right-handed, that type thing. That one I have not been able to figure, I hadn't been able to do that one yet. Um, study your recent calls back in your call history on your phone. This is something you can do while you're sitting there and try to talk yourself through. Uh, what were each of these calls? What were we talking about? Because again, that's tapping back into your memory. Taking new routes somewhere, eating with chopsticks. That's something new to learn. Uh, and then testing your vocabulary. And these are little things you can do, and these are also things that you can do. You don't have to write them on paper, but it's stuff that you can do uh, to work your memory, laying in bed, sitting at the stoplight, sitting at your desk, taking a mental break. In two minutes, how many words can you write down that start with a letter? That's one of the things they have people do lots of times when they're doing cognitive testing, is they'll say, uh, I'm gonna give you 30 seconds, name all the words you can think of that start with a C, something like that. 
So here's some others. Um, bridge is a favorite because you use memory, visualization, and sequencing, and it's social, so using bridge game. Uh, with travel, whenever we travel, we plan it. We have to have some flexibility. We may get out of our comfort zone. We meet new people. Um, culturally, kind of challenging yourself to watch plays, films, concerts, go to museums that maybe you'd have never gone to before. This all falls into that learning something new. You never know what you might learn. Uh, but again, allowing yourself to get outside of your comfort zone. Again, if, you, if we had you under a scan and we had you go to a museum of something maybe you never would have gone, let's say you never would have gone to the, uh, the uh, Cowgirl Museum here in uh, Fort Worth, and then you go and you're like, I didn't know that. I'm learning all this new stuff. Your brain's lighting up. Music. So it immediately improves mood, energy level. It's a stress reducer. Puzzles. We've talked about puzzles. If you are used to doing a 500 piece jigsaw puzzle, challenge yourself to do the thousand piece jigsaw puzzle. It's that type of thing. And then we've put some things on here that are, and again, you're going to get these slides. So if you want to go back and kind of work through some of these, write a word that pertains to autumn or something you see or do in autumn that starts with each letter of the alphabet. So you can start with, okay, I'm going to think about everything that has to do with fall or autumn that starts with an A, starts with a B, starts with a C, starts with a D. And then you work through the alphabet. Here's some other things, and these are things that I used to do with folks that were in the day program, who were in the earlier stages of the disease, and I would do it on a timer also, where I'd go, we're going to take one minute, let's name all the items we can think of that goes in a backpack, go. Or I might say, school supplies, go. And we would just start listing them. But these are things that we can do. Um, boys' names, frozen foods, here, uh, you may have played the game categories before or categories, that's a game. Uh, types of candy, apps on the phone, farm animals, college majors, places in Europe, medicines and drugs. And then fill in the blanks are also a good thing to do also. You can go online and find these type things. These are things that you also can do with somebody that has dementia, usually in the earlier to early uh, mid stages where you say something like a bed of roses, a drop in the bucket and you leave off that last part. But you can also get puzzles that are called fill-ins, where you have to sit there and think about each of these. And again, you're gonna get copies of all of this. Now, word association. If you can see the screen, I've got four, eight people up here, and I've got their name. And I'm gonna leave them up there for about 20 seconds, and then I'm going to take the names off and see if you can remember the names. Don't write them down. That's cheating. So I'm going to have you look at them for just a second. Now, can you name everybody? If you want to unmute yourself and tell me, or uh, I can't see the chat right now, what was her name in the upper left? Was it Shauna? Um, it was Shauna. It was Shauna. Now, what made you remember the name Shauna? I see some people talking, but I can't hear you. You'll have to unmute that you may have associated with Shauna? Her shiny her face. face. Shiny. She shines, Shauna shines. Mm -hmm. That's usually what people will say. Who's right next to Shauna? Lily. Lily. That was Lily. Was there anything that made you remember Lily? Lily leaps in the window. Looks like. Ah, that's a good one. So word association also. Who's that next to Lily? Tanya. Tanya. That is Tanya. And what about this girl on the end down here? Next Ashley. 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 Was there anything that made you remember Ashley? Daughter and granddaughter. <laughs> oh, you associated it with people you know. Was there anything about how she looked? Her complexion. Some people will say her hair 
is an ash blonde or her yeah. complexion. Yep. What about the lower left? Who's that? Hmm. Rachel. That was Rachel. Anything that helped you remember that? Rings in her ears. Rachel rings. Oh, very good. Uh, who's next to Rachel? George. 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 So anything about George? Red brick is George Washington. Ah. Okay. Who's next to George? Kendra. Kendra. Mm -hmm. Any reason you remembered Kendra? Well, I hate to say it publicly. I worked with refugees and she kind of reminded me of some of the refugees that I worked with. <laughs> no, that's not, that's, but that's an association. And yeah, I, I, I got Kendra, Kenya, you know. Yes, there you go. Who's the last one? William. 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 And what about William? It was a family name for me. Looks worried. William. I've had people say, um, Bill looks mad. You know, yeah, they were calling him Bill. Bill just mad. kind of looks mad. But that you used some type of word association is what that was. And probably later today, if we were in a, a four hour program, I would end that four hour program by putting that picture up again right there mm -hmm. and say, now who are these people? And several of you would be able to tell me at least half of them because you made an association, especially with the ones like Shauna Shines. You think if you don't make an association, it's harder to remember those? Because there would be no way I could remember those if I didn't make an association. Yeah, it usually is. It okay. usually is. But just like, um, let me see who was it that said Jane, made the comment about, you know, like Rachel rings, intentionally looking okay. for, okay, it's Rachel, she's got rings in her ears. So it's learning to do something like that um, and teaching yourself. Because some people just are terrible with names. You know, they'll tell I'm you. I'm terrible with that. I know I don't have a good short-term memory. I've always been tested on aptitude testing. But uh -huh. um, I thought, is it me? Or just if you do association, you're better at remembering. If you do association, you're better That's great. at remembering. That's really great. Yeah. yeah, you sure are. So um, here's kind of a, a, a summary of almost everything. You want to strive for progress and not perfection kind of reward yourself along the way. That's where computer games are fun because lots of times they'll give you a badge or they'll give you something and go, oh, I'm on the next level. Uh, developing a routine, finding things that work for you. And then if you catch yourself actually really having problems and you're concerned, make sure that you do something about that. So this is a um, summary of what the entire uh, brain health has been about. And again, you're gonna get all of these. Great timing. Anybody have okay. any questions? questions or anything that you do that's different where you do some cognitive type fitness? Mm -hmm. There's use a that, lot of uh, free apps. Uh, yeah, Marge, go ahead. I use that Elevate on my phone or on my iPad and it, 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 it goes in progression. It's if you do Elevate? well, then Elevate. The, okay. They send me free ones, but then you can also subscribe. And one of the ones that I always find challenging is listening. You, they'll, you'll listen to either, they'll have pictures of people and tell you a little bit about them. But then mm -hmm. you have to go back and match which person did what and why. It's kind of challenging for me anyway. But then they oh, also do math that. ones where you do percentages Ooh. and you do uh, estimating. Uh, they'll put a whole series of figures out and you have to estimate what the total is. And of course, it's all on a time thing. So you don't have a lot of time. Is but that a website, Elevate? I think it is, yeah. Okay. Elevate. I'll look there's at that a, one too. There's yeah. an app called Mind Games and they progress you harder and harder as you go along. Um, I've really enjoyed that one because I compete with myself. Good. Yeah. That's what I like about those also, Jane, is that mm -hmm. it will, and lots of times they are timed because they're tr mm -hmm. it's trying to yes. push you. Yeah, anything yes. that's timed that push, because even if you're doing your word searches or your crosswords, because I've had people tell me, Holly, I like the easy crosswords. Well, then keep doing them, but say, I'm going to finish it in 10 minutes this time. Yeah, mm -hmm. limited, yeah, that's true. And give yourself a time. So <laughs> and the point is to do something like we were saying that is, um, a variety of things, um, something new or novel, 
or going back and picking up something you used to do. If you haven't played the piano in 40 years, you've got to tap back in to be able to pick up the piano again. Um, so going back to music or to a language or taking a class or doing things like this even where you are uh, listening and paying attention and learning something new. There's tons of webinars and seminars out there right now that are virtual that are free. Uh, one of my favorite things to do is listen to TED Talks on YouTube because none of them are longer than 20 minutes and I subscribe to three to five minute TED Talks. Uh, you go in the, on their page, on the TED Talk page, you can put in your likes and your interest, and it'll send me things every week that say, you might be interested in, and it's the three to five minute ones. So whenever I have to stand up for a minute, I'll put those on and listen to them. And I'm forever finding out all kinds of good stuff. Is that an app? <clears throat> no, it's just on, um, you can go on YouTube and type in TED, T-E-D, in all caps talks and it'll bring up or you can go to the website of ted okay. ted talks uh and then you kind of put in they've got them just on health issues they've got them on social issues anything and everything you can think that somebody could talk about it's on there <laughs> all right everybody thanks for sharing okay, and we will email you the slides and the recording of this later today all right, thank, thank you. you. Thanks. Bye. You have a good day. Awesome. You too. Bye-bye.